Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Independent Speculator Interviews. Our guest of the day is Mark Faber. He's the world-renowned economist and editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. We'll have the URL right below for you to click on if you're interested in more. Now, I've met Mark several times. You've probably heard him or seen him on YouTube. He's famous for being somewhat irascible, somewhat contrarian, some, an outside-the-box thinker. So I really wanted to get his take on some of the things that are near and dear to our hearts today as resource investors. So, Mark, I know you've got a bigger uh, worldview, and anything that you have of value to share with our viewers is fine. But I wanted to get right into it and ask if you have any thoughts on the recent gold breakout you know, the Fed did exactly what was expected of it and reduced a quarter and, and, you know, things waffled at first, but then Trump upped the ante with his tweets and the China trade war, gold's, gold's gone through the roof, people are excited. Uh, and so the question is, you know, is this sustainable? Is it a flash in the pan or do the fundamentals, in your view as an economist, back up the, the excitement that uh, gold bugs now feel? Yes, I understand there is quite a bit of excitement. Having said that, I can tell you that in July, the bullish sentiment about U.S. equities hit kind of a 20 years high. So if we look at the bullish sentiment about gold, uh, we have to put this into the right perspective. In the case of stocks, we are more than 10 years into a bull market, which began in March 2009. In gold, uh, we had a strong bull market up to 2011, and then a meaningful correction until December uh, 2015. And since then, we've been rising from, say, approximately $1,000 to now over $1,400. But I have to say, uh, the bull market uh, in gold, in my opinion, and that makes me a little bit apprehensive about it, is that it's not acting all that well. First of all, it hasn't been yet confirmed by silver and platinum. And there is at the beginning of this move, move already a lot of bullish sentiment. So I think that... Uh, uh, I would be a little bit careful, let's say, you know, gold investors frequently say, oh, I have all my money in gold. I wouldn't do that because statistically it's measured that in the very long run, the stock market performs better than gold, whereby we would have to also measure which stock market in some countries probably gold has outperformed stocks and so forth. Uh, the issue here is really... I think an investor makes a big mistake by not having some gold because of all the monetary expansion that we have in the world, also because of these uh, less than zero interest rates. You have, we have now more than $14 trillion worth of bonds that have negative rates. And if you look at the budget in the US and the household uh, deficits in Europe, there's only one way they will go. They will go up. To finance all these deficits and also the deficits, the underfunded pension funds, uh, there's only one way for them, for the central banks to act, and that is to print money. And that in the long run should be favorable for gold. In fact, given all the money that has been printed, on a fundamental basis, gold is actually not very high. It's actually, its performance has been kind of disappointing. That's very interesting. I was actually going to ask you that. As an economist, how do you value gold? Or do you at all? Do you just look at the trends? I mean, some people like to divide the number of dollars in the world by the number of ounces of gold supposedly in Fort Knox. Uh, but, you know, I don't know that that really matters in the you real world of are, gold prices. There are still some ounces that support knots. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I'm but, not sure. <laughs> but I'm just saying that methodology is not one I have confidence as having any predictive value for the price of gold. Uh, do you have a way of looking at the value of gold uh, other than just to... Well, I think one way to look at it is uh, 
you look over a hundred years at uh, the decline in purchasing power of dollars or of any currency. You know, the, I come from Switzerland. We had for a long time the strongest currency. But uh, when I look at the price level today in Switzerland and I compare it to the time when I grew up, or when I look at some old movies in the US, uh, you could buy, you know, movie tickets for 20 cents. You, you, that doesn't exist anymore. So all these things have gone up dramatically. And then you look at gold, it was at 35, it was revalued to $35 in uh, 19, I think 33. And then they kept it at $35 for a very long time until essentially 1971, when Nixon went off the gold uh, window. And uh, so when I look at 1400 for gold and I compare it to what things did cost in the 1920s or 1880s and so forth, yeah, I say gold actually hasn't been a good performer. You know, if you bought stocks in 1900, uh, the S&P or the Dow, you've done much better with dividends reinvested. Because the one thing that makes a big difference in the performance of an asset is, does it generate cash flow? And uh, stocks until the 1950s, 1954, for the first time, stocks had a lower yield than bonds. Before that, they always had a higher yield, dividend yield than bonds. So by even the depression years, which were horrible for the stock market after 2932, but if you kept reinvesting the dividend that you got on these shares, you've done all right. And actually, I, I don't like to say that because I'm rather bearish about stocks. But the indices have done well. And maybe the US is a big exception because other markets haven't done that well. But I see it with my own portfolio, <coughs> which consists to some extent of high yielding shares, say REITs in Singapore. And over time, the dividend contributes a lot to the performance, a lot, if you keep reinvesting it. My wife, she doesn't reinvest it. She goes shopping. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I reinvest the dividends. Well, you bring up a really interesting point. You know, the, the long-standing complaint against gold has always been that it doesn't pay interest, right? But in the world yes. where governments are going to negative interest rates, <laughs> you know, a zero, yes. a zero coupon looks pretty good to me. Uh, I mean, doesn't that seem significant to you? Yes, I think it's a very good investment from that point of view. Compared to buying Swiss government bonds, 10 years, you lose probably about 5% over 10 years. But I want to say one thing about gold, and that has probably uh, kept some people from owning too much gold, and this is expropriation. You, you understand, when I look at uh, the best in the world is always to look at what the Jews are doing. The Jews have been buying a lot of art. And it's less likely that they will expropriate your Picasso from your house or a Monet or whatever Warhol than that they will expropriate gold. I, I you know, see so, that. I, that makes perfect sense to me, though I guess they would probably go for bail-ins and go after your savings account before they bother with physical bullion. That, that they've done already. Your savings account in uh, Europe, they all have, uh, not everywhere, but most of them have negative interest rates. Yes, most also. of them. So well, I'm, no, I, I meant actually seizing the money. It's a form of expropriation. It's a, an extortion. I, I get this, that. In most I, I get constitutions, that. Uh, it's contained that the government is not allowed to expropriate people. But negative interest rates is an expropriation.
I understand. I, I was just thinking of a Cyprus style bail in where you just declare a bank holiday and, and suddenly, <laughs> you know, large <laughs> amounts of cash are, are, have new owners. Yes. That could be the case. In Europe, I would not be surprised if most banks were, were uh, you know, uh, nationalized. Yeah, or coming the government. <laughs> All right. Well, there, there, now you're talking the, the, the gloom and the doom. So, actually, let's switch gears a little bit from gold and you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the global economy day is China, what's going on in Asia. And you live in Asia, so there's a lot yes. of coverage, a lot of talking heads telling us what to think and so on. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, being on that side of the ocean, is there anything that you think investors in North America or elsewhere around the world really should pay attention to? You know, what's important in all this noise? Well, I mean, uh, the reality and this is a, a story that uh, Americans don't like to tell. But the reality is that the Chinese know how to build something. If they build a bridge, the bridge is built at the cost that is about 10% of what America would spend on that bridge. And it is built in, say, a year. In other words, they have... A, incredible construction technology. This is a technology that people don't really talk about much because they always talk about high tech in, uh, in Silicon Valley and so forth. But you understand to build a bridge, to coordinate everything, to build a tunnel, to build a dam, uh, to build subways, it requires enormous coordination that the material comes at the right time and it uh, requires huge engineering skills, which some continents uh, simply don't have. So the Chinese, they can build these things throughout the world at relatively low cost, whereas other people can't do that. So this is one thing to understand. And the Chinese have rolled out their infrastructure at an incredible speed. Within, say, 30, 20, 30 years, <coughs> they modernized the whole country. They built the railroads efficiently. Sorry, let me, and, let me jump in and ask you, Mark, the, the significance of what you're saying. I think I understand, and, but sort of the bottom line is, you know, China should not just be seen as a place of cheap goods for Walmart. Like they have other businesses, powerful businesses that they can do business with the world. They're not dependent on the U.S. Is that's that's the point of what you're saying? Uh, one of the points, the point about the U.S. is also when I arrived in Hong Kong in '73. Until the say 1990s, the saying was, if uh, America sneezes, Asia catches a cold because most of the exports, maybe 80, 90 percent of Asian exports, they went to the U.S. But this is no longer the case. Mm -hmm. For most countries, uh, the exports to China are larger than to the U.S. And number two, for China and uh, countries like Taiwan, South Korea, the export to commodity producers around the world, Australia, uh, Brazil, Middle East, Central Asia, are larger than to the U.S. So the U.S., if they stopped importing any goods from China, it would hurt the Chinese. But exports to the U.S. are maybe 2-3% of GDP. Hmm. It wouldn't bankrupt the country. But it would cause them uh, significant discomfort. But then the question is, how much discomfort would it cause the U.S.? Yes. Do you think that the Democrats in California will go and assemble semiconductors and shoes and so forth? They're not going to do that. Yes, indeed. You can't take the homeless and put them in a factory. <laughs> it's not going to work. So how do you but see the trade the war playing out? Truth. The, this is the uncomfortable truth. A lot of uh, people in America, they're not capable to do some jobs. It's like 
there was this horrible truck accident in New Hampshire when a truck driver knocked off uh, seven motorcycle Harley drivers. I and, saw that. I mean, the guy, he was on drugs. <laughs> and I have a, I met once in a bar, all the people I know in the world, I met them in bars because I spent a lot of time in bars. And he was in Boston with his family and he owns a trucking business in Baltimore. He said to me, Mark, the biggest problem that we face is a shortage of truck drivers. Because to find people who are not alcoholic and no drug users is incredibly difficult. I mean, you're aware of this opioid yes. epidemic. I mean, this is horrible, but this has been promoted by the drug industry. <laughs> it's a good business. Yeah, I understand. Structural constraints there. So how do you see the trade war playing out between the U.S. and China? Or do you? Well, I mean, how do you see, uh, how could have, uh, how could the Second World War have ended? It ended essentially bad for everyone. <laughs> it ended better for the U.S. because uh, they became the leader of the world. But they could have become the leader of the world without going to Europe in a war. You understand? They lost a lot of soldiers. And in the American Civil War, it's the same. The, the casualties on both sides were huge. A war, and there's only a relative winner. <laughs> but everybody loses somewhat. And in this trade war, who knows who will be hurt the most? But I can tell you that in, say, India and in China, the stock market capitalization as a percent of the economy is very small. Mm. And only maybe in India, maybe 3% of the people own shares. In China, maybe 5% of people own shares. So if the stock market collapses or even goes to zero, the system is not really hurt so badly. I understand. The problem for China is more that they have a lot of debt. But if the U.S. stock market drops here by 20 percent, I guarantee a recession. Because you have to understand the distinction between the stock market in the U.S. in the 70s. At that time, the stock market in the 70s is between 25 and 30 percent of the economy. In other words, the economy was 100, uh, yes. the stock market was 20%. Now, the stock, the, the economy is 100, but the stock market is 150. Then you take the bond market, it's another 150. So you have a market <laughs> cap, the, the capital market is something like 300% of GDP, which is uh, very dangerous because the economy no longer drives Equities, but it's equities, equities and drive. bonds that yes, drive the I understand. Economy. And people's retirements are wrapped up in the stock market. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, the whole, I tell you, that's why I like to have some gold. That's why I'm telling your viewers uh, how much they allocate to gold is up to them. But I think that if you really look at all the factors, the money printing that has been going on for a long time, and it will continue. Uh, you look at the international uncertainties, at the trade war, and so forth. <coughs> I think <coughs> that, uh, as I said before, the price of gold is actually not very high. Right. So, and that's a good thing if you're considering going long. Though I, I always have to emphasize for everybody a distinction that my mentor Doug Casey taught me, and that is. Uh, you know, gold is owned as a safe haven. It's owned for prudence, not as a speculation. He doesn't speculate on gold. I don't have savings in gold because I think the price is going to go higher. I have it because it's gold. <laughs> Whatever happens to anything else, it's still gold, right? Well, I do both because the gold shares are, of course, very volatile. Yes, the gold, and, the gold shares uh, are for speculating. I know lots of people, including Doug, that have made a lot of money out of gold shares. You know, they have, if you hit a gold stock at the right time, uh, they can go up 
even with a 10, 20 percent move in the price of gold, they can go up three times. Yes, yes, we've seen this. Okay, well, but that's a question for Doug. Just uh, we've taken a lot of your time, which we appreciate. I just want to end up though with uh, handing you the the microphone, as it were, and asking you, from your perspective, what's going on in the world today? Is there any particular trend or forecast you're willing to make that you think? investors and people interested in finance around the world really should be paying attention to? I mean, I think the most important trend is a dumping down of the population in the Western world. You know, this whole issue about gender and so forth, I mean, it's endless nonsense. And uh, this political uh, correctness is another issue. And it all leads in to one road and the same road with the same result. It's socialism. And I, for me, this is something unbelievably difficult to understand because I grew up in the, I'm born 46, I both uh, grew up in the 50s and 60s. The first time I went to Eastern Europe was in 68. And I can tell you, you can't believe how poor the Czech Republic was, Czechoslovakia at that time, in 68. And no freedom and no, uh, people had no initiative and there were no lights and nothing functioned. And the same happened in Russia when with my wife, the first time to Russia in 1981. You went to the markets and the markets had tomatoes and apples that were rotten. And in front of these stands, there were queues of a hundred people to buy these rotten tomatoes. And this is socialism. And for me, uh, there are two things that have surprised me in my life. Negative interest rates, you know, because <laughs> I grew up in an environment where interest rates went up until 1981 on treasuries to 15%, to over 15%. And now we have negative rates in Europe, uh, 13, 14 trillion dollars. And the second thing is that if you have a capitalistic system, and I understand there was a lot of abuse, but this abuse is essentially uh, facilitated by a big government, because then you need the lobbyists and then this the whole the, the, the free market, the real capitalistic system is distorted through interventions. But that you would move from that to socialism, that is something beyond me. I understand. And I tell you, the US undoubtedly is only a question of time, if not, uh, if not in 1921, uh, if Trump is re-elected, you still have some sort of capitalism, but it's not a good capitalism. It's yeah. also interventions. He's an interventionist. Crony capitalism. But if the socialists come in, and they'll come at latest 1924 into power, uh, then I think that the U.S. will really face a hard time economically. Well, you're focusing on the doom and the gloom more than the boom there, Mark, but that's what you're known for, so it's okay. Yeah. Uh, we'd rather have you uh, tell us what you really think than try to sugarcoat it. So thank you. Thank you very much again, and uh, good luck with all. Yes, thank you very much. Right, Let's take hope care. that I'm wrong with all the doom. <laughs> we'll okay. see. All right.